welcome you here this morning. We're just going to continue to worship. And on the screen behind us, like we've had in the past few weeks, we're going to have some scriptures and reflection that as we continue to worship, we just invite you to, to take to heart these scriptures, to read through them, to meditate, to think on how great, how faithful, how powerful God is, to see his character. And maybe you come in here on the top of the world and had a great week, or maybe you just need to allow his presence and his character to just be reminded to you of how great he is. So just join with us as we just play musically this morning. Use this time to just kind of center in and bring our hearts and our lives to the King of Kings.
Amen. We will bless the Lord, oh, our souls. Everything within us, we bless your holy name. I want to invite both Sook up, and she's going to lead us in prayer this morning. And as well, just as she is coming, uh, we just want to celebrate. I guess it was just yesterday or a few days ago, uh, she received citizenship for Canada or got her papers and her work visa. So... <laughs> It's permanent residence. Oh, permanent residence. Okay, Sorry. but it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let us pray. Thank you, Sovereign God, for who you are, our Father, for how we can worship you as a church on campus and through the online. As we humbly come to you together, cover us with your precious blood and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for how you are listening our prayers. We praise you for my permanent residence, how it came so smooth and faster beyond the pandemic situation, and also praise you for how you have helped Carol McMoon to be healed from a severe infection this week. We pray for her to regain strength and we pray you for how many people are responding to pastor's small group request. It is so exciting and where your will is, you make a way for us. Continue make your ways in our lives and churches. May you orchestra our lives according to your will. Oh God, when we feel ourselves is not good enough, you say to us, I am enough for you. God, you are so, so enough for us. Help us to find genuine, pure satisfaction in you alone first. First John 4, 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Oh God, please remember the people who are feeling lonely in COVID pandemic. Pray for, pray for protection for all kinds of lies from the enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. Also, pray for Carolyn and her family who lost her mother. Thank you how her mom is with you now in heaven. But we mourning together with her and we seek your presence to them. And we ask for divine comfort and the spirit of the truth on each of them. And pray for our church members, those who need the healing from you, physically, emotionally, mentally. We want to lift up our brother Jason Wright as he is still going through the cancer treatments. Give all the wisdom to doctors and strength and encouragement from you to Jason and his family. Thank you, Lord, how you are so care for them so much and journey together with them in hard times. And we want to lift up the families as they prepare to send the kids back soon to schools give peace, wisdom, and guidance, and safety to teachers, parents, and kids. We surrender all to you. And bless Pastor Luas as he is going to share the message with us soon. Help us respond well to you, and let us walk closer to you day by day. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Thank you very much, Lydia, Nathan, the worship team, um, Bo Souk for praying, uh, everybody who's involved in ministering and at the doors, um, operating Zoom. It's good to, to be in God's house, isn't it? Amen, it is. I just want to bring you up to date on a couple of announcements before I get into the message uh, this morning. But there is, um, I mean, we want to thank you, everyone who's been faithful in giving and supporting the church throughout this pandemic. Uh, there are many ways to give, and uh, thank you all. Uh, you're, you're so faithful. The Lord has been um, good to us. As If you were here last week or you watched the service online, uh, you know we mentioned that uh, we received a $25,000 gift from another church, uh, from Woodvale Church in Ottawa, uh, to help us. And um, it's just amazing the way God has been working through this whole time. He's so faithful. And I was talking to someone who wasn't in the service last week, but they watched the service online later, um, either later Sunday or, or in the week, and they said, wasn't that exciting the way the body of Christ gets together and helps each other in times of need? So um, it's, it's excellent to just to know how God is faithful in all, in all things. I um, also want to mention about small groups. We've, um, if you saw my word of encouragement on Thursday, you know that we're, we're going to be, we, Pastor Nathan and I have actually mentioned it a number of times, but we're going to be starting small groups in the fall. And if you're interested in hosting, being a host for small groups, as a first stage in, in getting groups organized, uh, please go online. And uh, just go to ministries, small groups, and uh, let us know that you want to host or you're interested in information about hosting. Um, and uh, we will get in touch with you. Or if you're not online, you can just connect with myself or Pastor Nathan um, in person after the service. Also, Samaritan's Purse um, shoe boxes is still happening despite COVID. There are still people in need around the world, and Samaritan's Purse is uh, responding uh, with Operation Christmas Child. And if you want to fill out a physical box, uh, you could start buying some stuff because, you know, back to school sales and all the rest. I think things at the dollar store are 99 cents this week. Uh, I'm not sure. You better check that. But um, that was a joke. I, I heard the people online laugh. Come on. Okay, so uh, you could be uh, preparing your shoe boxes, or you can go online to SamaritansPurse.ca, and you could virtually fill out a box uh, there uh, if you'd rather not fill one out physically. So they will be coming into the church uh, within the next couple of weeks, and we'll have more information for you. And also, as well, if you are still interested in face masks, um, you can purchase them, fundraiser for the missions uh, department, you can do that online. You can click in and just donate some money, or you can just talk to Karen Leach right over. Karen, wave your hand, and uh, she can um, make arrangements for you to get those. All right. Well, today we are going to continue in our series that we've started about seven or eight weeks ago um, on being a renewed church. Pastor Nathan and I have been dissecting Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and we've talked about the apostles' teaching, prayer, worship, fellowship, and stewardship in the past few weeks. We could use the first century church, that very first church, as a model for us. We could measure ourselves and our spiritual life against theirs to get an idea of how we are doing how we are living what Christ intended. Not that they were perfect, of course, but they were a church that um, he established. And they were the ones, the apostles were in elbow contact with him. They lived with him for three years. They knew what he wanted and, and how he was setting up his church. I trust you've been tracking as we've had these messages with the quiet time at the end, even if you're doing it online on through Zoom or later in the week, um, that you're just quieting yourself and listening to God and asking God questions that we, uh, we give you to ask. So this morning's topic is enjoying favor. 
Now I'll get into the scripture in just a moment. But I've been burdened that I don't get in the way of you hearing the word of God this morning. I, and I've just been praying this through. The Lord um, help people not hear me, please. Hear the Holy Spirit. This is an important topic. Something that the first church was known for and was very, very significant. It's, it's crucial, actually critical, to help us evangelize. It's one of the most important factors in evangelism. And yet it's so easily excused or looked over in our own lives um, that I really believe the Lord wants us to hear what he has to say this day. It's a challenging subject. However, it's one of the things that was said about the first church in Acts chapter 2, and we'll read that in just a moment. They enjoyed favor of the people. Now, church history tells us that that favor they enjoyed only lasted for a short while. Within a few chapters of the book of Acts, uh, we see that the Jewish leaders began persecuting the church in Jerusalem. And that persecution spread. It actually dispersed the church. And in Acts chapter 8, so we're reading from two, six chapters later, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says this, great persecution broke out on the day that Stephen was martyred. So not too long after that, we're talking here in the 30s A.D., in 64 A.D., the Roman Empire began persecuting Christians under uh, Caesar Nero. And that persecution last, lasted over 200 years to, to, until 313 when the Roman Empire declared kind of a, 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 a tolerance of all religious faiths throughout the empire. And that kind of ended the, the severe persecution that the church had been living under for 300 years. But it's interesting that favor was still part of the heritage of the Christians, even through that time of persecution. And I've alluded to this before in messages, you might have caught it, or, uh, that secular historians marveled at how Christians died well when they were being persecuted. Many things are written about them in secular history, including that they showed compassion for fellow sufferers. They showed love for their persecutors. And they showed confidence in their faith. So even in time of persecution, it appears that the early church enjoyed the favor of the people. But our focus this morning is going to be a little more narrow. It's going to be pre-persecution. So it's going to be right at Acts chapter 2 when this first church was formed. And we want to look at this first church and who, get that, who they modeled their behavior after to earn the recognition that they enjoined, enjoyed the favor of the people. Because that's obviously the foundation that enabled them to last those 300 years of church life and gave them the, the, the reputation that they had of being able to die well and, and to be loving right to the end during that 300-year time of persecution. So what did they do to be favored? So let's read in Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible, you want to turn there or follow with me on the screen. Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I don't believe that that's coincidence that Luke writes they enjoyed the favor 
and the Lord added to their number. So Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. He was a doctor, and he authored two books in the New Testament, uh, the Gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts. And they're kind of a part one and part two of a series of, of writing that he, that he had. And in, in this writing, throughout the, the Gospel and in the book of Acts, he uses a, a phrase in the original language that is translated into English as the people. Okay, that phrase, the people, refers to the people to whom the gospel message was directed. That's what Luke uses. Every time he uses this phrase, the people, in his two books, he's referring to the people to whom the gospel message is being spoken to or directed. Or said another way, he's referring to non-believers. The people are those who don't yet know Christ. So why would it be important for the church, for that first church to enjoy good favor with non-believers? Well, for what I believe is the same reason why it's important for us to enjoy the favor of non-believers. It's important because the church, get this, carries the absolute greatest message that people have ever heard. Okay, some of you in this room or maybe some of you listening might have been brought up and, and, and you were told this, that Coca-Cola was the real thing. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> well, let me refresh your memory. Jesus is the real thing. He, amen, amen, that's right. He came to give us the experience of our lives, communion with God and others. That's what he came to accomplish. We have the key to the greatest human experience possible. God loves people. So much so that he sent his son to die for people's wrongdoing. John 3.16, you know it well. God loved the world. God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. That's the contemporary English version, and that, that, I, I love the way it says it. We'll, if you have faith in him, you will have eternal life and never really die. Who's going to listen to that message if our audience isn't in good favor with us? We can only reach people we are in good relationship with. And what that means is that we can't afford, as Christians, we can't afford to offend people. If we've got a message that's directed to people who don't know God's love, we can't afford the luxury of offending people. We can't afford isolating people with our talk or our superior acting and, and, and the way we carry ourselves. We can't afford to be misunderstood by people by talking or using language that is religious or, you know, complicated for them to understand. We can't afford to even misunderstand people as they talk to us about their needs or, or, or giving pat answers to, to what people are saying. We, we can't afford to judge people especially if they don't have the same values that we do as Christ followers. I have a couple of... Um, oh, a nephew and a niece who are um, gay in their lifestyle. And my niece was getting married this next weekend. She was supposed to get married, but COVID you know, kind of put a kibosh on all of that. 
And uh, when Lydia and I first found out about the wedding, we thought, wow, we have to go. She's my niece. I love her. Yeah, so her lifestyle is not my lifestyle. It's not what I believe is God's best for us, but, but that doesn't matter. She's a wonderful person, and I love her. I can't afford to judge her because she doesn't have my values. We can't even afford to be negative about everything, to be down on everything, to complain about everything. As Christ followers, we, we can't afford the luxury of, of you know, complaining about the government because we, we really don't know what the government does behind closed doors to make the crazy decisions that we think they're making. We don't know all that goes into that. We can't afford the luxury as Christ followers of being negative and against everything, about preaching against this, preaching about that. We, we need to show love and to gain the favor of people. How many of you really enjoy hanging around with someone who's always complaining? <laughs> yeah, not many of us. especially during COVID-19 and this pandemic that the world has thrown us into. I have found that people are, are polarized with fear. On the one side, we have people who are uh, laid into with fear over the thought of COVID-19 disease and, and this virus that is coming in that, that's transmitted through droplets in our breath and uh, it, it's kind of like the breath of death. People are paralyzed by it still. And on the other side, we have people who, who perhaps have read George Orwell's 1984 one too many times. And, and you know, the big government is moving in. To their, you've maybe seen the movie Enemy of the State, or, or you've seen The Island, or, or even Snowden. And you know that the government is working to do things and to, 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 to just, to, you know, to, to box people in. And, and we're all just wearing masks. We're doing stuff we're just, we're, we're told to do, you know. And, and this big government is just totalitarian over us. And, and people are polarized. As Christ followers, we can't afford either of those extremes. We can't afford to be negative and, and dragging down people we don't even know and talking negative about this or that. We, we can't do that. See, you and I, we are called to be light. Light in darkness. When there's all this negativity, all this confusion, all this stuff that we don't know how to maneuver through, we might not know how to do it either, but we are called to be light. We're called to be bigger than that. And if that means not having an opinion about how the government is operating and doing things, so be it. If that means not having uh, an opinion uh, about what is going on in our world, then so be it. If you can't talk positively, maybe we shouldn't be spreading negativity. This virus, yes, can take a life. It can maim you even after you are free from COVID-19. Your life could be different for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's real. But we are just not big enough to understand it all. So we need to trust in the God of all grace and love him first and find favor with all people. Lydia and I, ministered, as, as many of you know, at a Bible college for 12 years, and, and we worked under three different presidents there, and all of them were, were brilliant people, uh, just wonderful, and, and I was really fortunate that um, I got to work closely with one of them in, in my role uh, for, for quite a number of years, and, and he was a man who could have complained about everything because he had life experience in so many areas. He was wise. But I saw him, as I got to know him, I saw him as a man who understood what it was like to be at the top of an organization, yet he refused to talk down 
at anyone in the room or not in the room. When people weren't there or when they were there. I knew a VIP or a, a VP, a vice president of an electronics company in the late 80s in Canada. It was a, a really big, strong company, and they, uh, he, was, he was the vice president. And he was a man who refused to badmouth his competitors in Canada, in the, other, in the electronics industry, and, as it turned out, his own company, as they downsized him out of a job. He refused to talk bad or down or negative. It seems that people of great influence are not quick to be negative. Probably because they know that you can't influence people from a negative position. And if you want to talk about our politicians who, you know, every four years or so get embroiled in debates and mudslinging and all the rest of that stuff, you can talk about them, but I'm not going to model my life after people who are embroiled in a popularity contest for power. That's just not who I'm going to look at. We, as the Church of Jesus Christ, cannot afford to be prejudiced, closed-minded, or exclusive in any way. And, and we spoke about our response to prejudice, or to racism, sorry, just at the end of June. Um, because I really believe that was such an important issue that face, facing our world and our church, or the church. We can't afford to talk behind people's backs. We've we got to be open and accepting and loving of all people, young and old and everybody in between, that whole mix. We must love people and gain favor with them. The first church modeled their lives. Who did they model? They modeled after Jesus. They didn't model after the, the Pharisees or, or the Roman uh, government of, of that time. They modeled their life after Jesus. And he taught them how to enjoy the favor of the people. Now, just to be clear, Jesus did talk bad about certain people. He actually condemned certain people, the religious hypocrites. However, he was Jesus, and he knew all thoughts. He knew people's hearts, and he could judge impartially. Anyone else? No, we, we can't. We can't even begin to judge as he did. So this morning, let's not look at how he treated the religious elite, but let's consider a few instances in the Gospels of how he influenced found favor with normal people and how he was able to transfer or, or, or give them the opportunity of eternal life. So let's look at four things, four ways, four instances of how Jesus handled people. Um, and, and the first one is, is threefold, so there's not four ways, there's seven ways, I guess. But anyway, um, Jesus didn't criticize, condemn, or complain about people. Matthew 26, the disciples criticize a woman for pouring perfume on Jesus' head. In verse 10 and 11, he says, Jesus, uh, aware of this, of their criticism, said, why do you criticize the woman for doing such a good thing? Verse 12, when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it in prepare, to prepare me for my burial. And, and they weren't even aware that he was going to die on the cross yet. They, they didn't understand, but somehow this woman anointed Jesus with oil, and he refused to criticize her. He also, uh, some people wanted to quarter, corner Jesus on, on, on a matter of the law, and so they brought him a woman who had been caught having an affair. 
she was just caught red-handed, uh, and, and obviously the guy with her as well. But he, didn't, he wasn't brought there. They just wanted to single out this woman, and they wanted to carry out the death sentence on her as according to Hebraic law in the Old Testament. And in John chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus didn't complain. When people bought little children to have him bless them, in Matthew 19, it says, One day parents brought their children to Jesus so that he could lay hands on them and pray for them. And the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus says, let, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and bless them before they left him. Yeah, Jesus didn't criticize, condemn, or complain. And he was able to gain favor with people. Another way Jesus won the favor of the people was he honored them. Right from the beginning of his ministry, uh, this is interesting, he he went to John the Baptist to be baptized. His cousin, he, he went to him to be baptized to honor John's ministry. He spoke publicly about John. He spoke highly of John. Matthew eleven eleven says, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none Jesus said, is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus honored people, and so he was able to gain favor with them. The first church learned that from Jesus. Jesus was a good listener. He encouraged others to talk about themselves, and he asked questions. John chapter 4, verse 9, he stopped by a well for a drink, uh, and he began talking with a woman there who was drawing water for herself. And the woman, it says in John 4, 9, the woman was surprised, for Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Luke chapter 8 verse 45 Jesus was being pressed by the crowds and they were all around him and, and he knew someone had touched him and received a healing of, in their body because some, some power came out of him he felt and so he turned around he stopped the procession he stopped everyone who was walking around him and he said whoa whoa wait a minute who touched me and he, and he wasn't trying to signal this woman out. He, he wanted to engage her. He wanted to know who he had healed. He wanted to, as the scripture says in, in verse 45, he, he wanted to commend her faith. And then there was the blind man who was sitting by the side of the road in, in Luke chapter 18, verse 41. And Jesus uh, was coming by and people were talking, hey, this Jesus, he's coming down the road, you know. And this, so this blind man who couldn't see it but heard the commotion, he said, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me, he yelled out. And, and when Jesus heard that, he stopped. And get this, he says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus engaged him. Jesus also didn't talk in religious terms when he spoke with people. But he used terms and ideas and, and images they could understand. He was in a, an agrarian culture. And so he talked a lot about harvests and seeds and, and planting and, and animals and Peter, Andrew, brothers, and James and John, brothers, were fishermen. And he could have said to them, come and follow me and be my disciples and I will help you or I will teach you how to convert people and to bring to them the redemption of their souls and relationship with God. 
he could have said that, but no, what he said to, to them in Mark chapter 1, verse 17 was, come and follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. If, you, um, if you've seen that, um, the Chosen series, uh, you've got to download the app, it's a, uh, a seasonal series on the life of Jesus. Um, I think it's the third, third or fourth um, episode where Jesus says this very thing from Mark chapter 1 where he says to Peter, Andrew, James, and John, follow me. And, and it's funny, Andrew, or uh, James and John look at their father Zebedee and, and their father says, go. <laughs> you nuts, kids, go. Follow that man. He's going to teach you how to fish for men. Not how to bring redemption to the souls of people who have betrayed God and lost. And he, no, he didn't talk in religious terms. He talked in words they understood so that they could handle it and they could live with it. Now, those four or seven, depending how you count, <laughs> examples aren't exhaustive. But they do show us how Jesus dealt with the people as Luke would tell us, those who do not believe in him, those who did not yet believe. And we can learn that if we treat people well, if we aren't negative, if we, if we somehow can look past all the junk and the garbage that we are in in this culture with, with all that's happening around, if we can somehow do that and love people, we will be steps ahead in evangelizing to them. I want to conclude with this, um, with a story of a person you're well familiar with. Lydia, if you can come to the keys. Um, You, um, you know uh, this historical person, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi. He was, um, his name is familiar to all of us. He employed nonviolent methods to ultimately lead India out of British colonialism and in, in, to form an independent India and Pakistan. He is said to be the one who has inspired modern civil rights movements around the world. Um, people like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, were inspired by Gandhi. People like, um, I didn't write his name down, South African apartheid, Mandela, Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Whoever said that? Um, Nelson Mandela was said to have been influenced by Gandhi. Many others saw that this man had a way of being peaceful in his demonstration. Here are some things that Gandhi said about Christianity. Let me give you just a few examples. He said this once. I did once seriously think of embracing the Christian faith. This is Mahatma Gandhi saying this. He said this. The gentle figure of Christ, so patient, so kind, so loving, so full of forgiveness that he taught his followers not to retaliate when abused or struck, but to turn the other cheek. I thought it was a beautiful example of a perfect man. One of Gandhi's contemporaries was a missionary by the name of Stanley Jones. He was a missionary to India, and he had met with Gandhi at one time, perhaps many times, but in this one 
this one interaction between the two of them, he asked Gandhi, he said, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, and, and as it turned out, if you read through a biography or history of Gandhi, he loved the New Testament. He loved especially Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And so it appears that he obviously quoted him. So Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is that you appear so to so adamantly reject being his follower? Gandhi replied, Oh, I don't reject Christ. I love Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike Christ. It is said that Gandhi rejected the Christian faith because he was turned off by the sin of segregation that was practiced in the church at that time. Racism. It was due to that experience that Gandhi later declared this. I'd be a Christian if it were not for the Christians. Now we're talking in the early 20th century when he lived and was, he died in, in 1948, I think, or 47. But here's a man who taught us a lesson that the first church knew all about having to find favor with people. We need to gain the favor of people so that they will not talk like Gandhi talked. That they will not reject Christ because of our actions. We must find favor with our families, with our community. With anyone we want to reach, we need to find favor with them. And to do that, we must act like Christ. So we're going to get to our time of reflection here. If you have a notebook and you want, or your, your tab or phone and you want to take notes, it's good because I want to. You're going to ask God some questions. Okay, I'm going to lead us in this asking God some questions. Just as Lydia plays in, in the background, just drain your mind of anything that is not pertinent to the questions. And, and sincerely ask God these things. Because this thing about finding favor is so important to the church's response to spreading the gospel that I really believe we need to, to not fool ourselves and not say, oh, no, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. I, I, I don't, I'm not like that. We have to really reflect and look inside. Ask God this. Am I often negative about the present world as it is changing? This is just a litmus test we could use. Whether you're on one side of the, of the pendulum swing or the other side, wherever you fit in between, whether you think you're just so, you know, rightly balanced in your thoughts, and are you often negative about what we're going through as a world? Because, you know, I mean, hey, the whole world is talking about what we're going through right now. This is universal. Has fear gripped me? Ask God. Either fear, fear that the government's going to take over our lives and they're just telling us what to do, or fear that this virus is going to kill everybody and I'm going to just try to stay safe. Just take some moments, quietly reflect and listen. Ask God.
to second question or second set of questions. I'm going to ask you to reflect on and ask God. And and here's this is the rubber meeting the road right here on this set. Okay, uh, earlier in the service we prayed for families who are sending their kids back to school. How many of you are somehow connected somehow to someone who is sending children into the school system in, in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, just about everybody. Yep. At home, no doubt. Ask God this. How can I be light and influence to them? I, ha I have a neighbor across the street who, who's undecided. She doesn't know what to do with her two young children. She trusts part of the system, and she doesn't trust the other part. And, and she just, yeah. So how can I be light? How can I be influence in her life? How can I gain favor so that they will listen? Ask God right now. Just, just do it. Let's, let's ask God these two questions. And, and this is real. This is, you could actually leave this place and, and, and have light to bring to people in your family, in your community, in your, in your circle. Because there are people who are just, you know, my brother's a principal in, in Montreal. He's a, and he's got teachers and staff on one side who are asking him questions, and he's got the school board and the government on the other side. And he's just, he feels like he's so in the middle, and it's just awful. And, and we, we need to... Be light. Because people are dying and going to hell. Do you know that? This virus isn't going to kill them. It's sin that's going to kill them. But we need to be light. We need to gain the favor of people so they'll listen to the life that we live. Let's ask God. trust you've heard from God, whether you're watching this tomorrow, whether you're watching it now, or here in this room. Would you stand with me? Father, help us see that there are people who need to hear the good news that you love them. Help us gain favor with people so we can be like that first church and we would see 
daily people added to our numbers. Now may God, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of God's Holy Spirit that lives in you. Amen. God bless each of you this day.